Well, let's turn to the book of James. <laughs> the book begins James. It's generally believed that James was a half-brother to Jesus, born to Mary and Joseph after the birth of Jesus. In Mark's gospel, he tells us that when Jesus came back to Capernaum and he was teaching in the synagogue, the people were astonished at his wisdom, the mighty works, and they said, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Jude and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. But Jesus responded, a prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own family and in his own house. Later on, as Jesus had been going almost nonstop, the people were crowding around him wherever he went. They hardly gave him an opportunity to eat. The multitudes pressing on him. We read in Luke 8, 19, then came to him his mother and his brothers. And they could not get to him because of the crowd. And he was told that his mother and brothers were outside and wanted to see him. And it's generally thought that his brothers did not really believe on him until after his resurrection from the dead. But James became a leader in the church in Jerusalem after the resurrection of Jesus. And when the first church council was called in Jerusalem to deal with what relationship the Gentile believers should have to the law, it was James that was overseeing the council, and it was James that wrote the uh, position of the church concerning the Gentile believers. So he did take a real place of leadership in the early church. In church history, there is a early church historian, one of the earliest, his name was Eusebius, and he wrote a book called Ecclesiastical History. And in chapter 23, he writes of the martyrdom of James who he calls the brother of Jesus. He tells us that Paul, after he was sent by Festus to Caesar, the Jews frustrated because they could not kill him, turned against James, the brother of the Lord, and they conducted him to a public place and demanded that he renounce his faith in Jesus before all of the people. However, he with a firm voice confessed that Jesus was the Son of God and our Savior and Lord. And they then seized him and killed him. Clement, one of the early church fathers, reported that he was thrown down from the wing of the temple and beaten to death with a club. Hegesippus also wrote of him saying, but James, the brother of the Lord, who was known as James the Just, because there were so many by the name of James, they uh, identify, identified him as James the Just, that uh, he often entered the temple area alone and could be seen on his knees praying for the forgiveness of the people. And they say that he kneeled so much that his knees became as hard as camel's hide. Hegesippus recorded that the scribes and Pharisees placed James on the wing of the temple and cried out to him, 
O thou just man, whom we ought all to believe, since the people are led astray after Jesus, who was crucified, declare to us what is the truth of Jesus who was crucified. And James answered with a loud voice, Why do you ask me respecting Jesus, the Son of Man? He is now sitting in the heavens at the right hand of the great power and is about to come in the clouds of heaven. Many were excited by his testimony, began to chant, Hosanna to the Son of David. And the Pharisees said to each other, we made a real mistake in giving him the opportunity to testify of Jesus. Let's go up and cast him down that they may dread to believe his testimony. And they cried out to the people and they said, James the just is deceived. And when they had cast him down, some said, let's stone him. So they began to stone him, and because he did not die immediately, he began to pray, I entreat thee, O Lord God and Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And thus, as they continued to stone him, one of the priests, who was a son of Rechab, uh, cried out, Listen, he is praying for you. Then one of them with a the fuller's club beat out the brains of James the just. So this is the James who is writing this little epistle. He identifies himself as James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The word in the Greek is douloi, a slave. He identifies himself as the author of this book and as a slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. As a slave, he had no rights of his own. He is the property of his master. His paramount duty in life is to obey the will of his master. He does not see it as a shameful thing to be a slave of God and of Jesus Christ, but a position of supreme honor. He talks about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, don't think that that's first, middle, and last name as we so often say, well, the Lord Jesus Christ is though its first, middle, and last name. The name, his name is Jesus. Lord is his title. If I were writing and uh, punctuating, I would put a comma after Lord. And, and people, I think, would then better understand it. The Lord, that's his title. That's my relationship to him. He's my Lord. Jesus is his name. As the angel said to Joseph, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And Jesus is a contraction. It's a Greek word, but it is the Greek word for the Hebrew name Joshua, which is Joshua, Jehovah is salvation. That's his name. Call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Christ is who he is. He's the Messiah. Christos in the Greek is the equivalent of the Hebrew Mashiach, which is the anointed one. So he is the anointed one. He's the promised Messiah. So the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. He addresses his letter to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. God promised to Abraham that he would give to Abraham's descendants the land in which Abraham had come to sojourn. The Lord had called Abraham out of Babylon to journey 
to a place that the Lord would show him. And so he by faith went, not knowing where he was going. But when he came to the land, there on the top of Mount Bethel, the Lord told him to look in all of the directions. And as far as he could see in every direction, the Lord said, I have given it to you and to your descendants forever. So the promise was made to Abraham in about the year 1900 BC. Some 450 years later, around 450 BC, the descendants of Abraham began to take possession of this land that God had promised to the descendants of Abraham. And about 700 years later, around the year 720 BC, the northern kingdom, the 10 tribes of the northern kingdom that was known as Israel, were taken captive by the Assyrians. And they were dispersed by the Assyrians uh, throughout the world. And that began the dispersion of the Jews around 720 BC, or actually of Israel. Then about uh, a little more than 100 years later, the southern kingdom, the two tribes of the southern kingdom were conquered by uh, Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, and they were taken as captives to Babylon. Some of them fled to Egypt. But the land then remained uh, sort of desolate for 70 years. And in the year about 536, uh, the King Cyrus uh, gave the decree that allowed those Jews that wanted to throughout the Persian Empire, because the Assyrian Empire was conquered by Babylon, Babylon Empire was conquered by the Persian Empire, and now the Persian Empire, the king, allows those who want to return to Jerusalem and to the land. Many of them have become very successful and prosperous in the places where they had been scattered and really didn't want to return. So they remained where they were in the various countries, but a large number came back and they began the rebuilding of the temple. And of course, in 445 BC, Artaxerxes uh, gave the decree to Nehemiah uh, to restore the city of Jerusalem. In about 500 years later, the Romans came in after a rebellion by the Jews in 70 AD, and they again conquered the city of Jerusalem, devastated and destroyed the city of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and once more the Jews were dispersed throughout the world, that is, those that had returned, they are again dispersed throughout the world. So James sends this letter to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. Now, James is writing just about 10 years before uh, the Romans conquered Jerusalem. Uh, so it was still at that time a nation. Jews were still predominantly living there in Jerusalem and in the uh, land, uh, but uh, they were then dispersed about 10 years later. But even at the time that James was writing, many of the Jews were still uh, dispersed uh, around the world. And so he is addressing uh, his letter uh, to those who are scattered, uh, the tribes that are scattered abroad. The miracle, of course, is that they did still maintain a national identity. Though they had been, many of them, centuries 
living outside of the land. They still maintain their national identity. And it, 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 that in itself is a miracle. There is no other ethnic group who has existed for more than four or five generations without a homeland and continued to maintain their national identity. And uh, it's, it's quite a miracle that uh, the Jews have, even up to the present day, maintained their national identity. In 1948, they became a nation once again, and they remain so to the present day. But though there is again the nation of Israel, over half of the Jews are still scattered abroad and do not live in Israel. Because of anti-Semitism, uh, they are going back to the land. Anti-Semitism has been an ugly thing that has raised its head throughout the years, and it was something that was prophesied by Moses, their dispersion and uh, their uh, being evilly entreated, and, and that has surely been true. So, the author, James, he is writing to the tribes that are scattered abroad, the 12 tribes that are scattered. After the introduction, he goes right into the heart of his message. Count it all joy, he said, when you fall into divers temptations. Kay was saying, were they scuba divers or what? Uh, no, she really didn't. Uh, <laughs> but to understand the word divers, just put an E on the end of it and you have diverse, and that's basically what he's saying. Diverse temptations. Temptations can take many different forms. But the word temptations is a little misleading also. In fact, uh, most of the translations uh, outside of King James uh, does translate this as test. And, and that really is the idea, uh, count it all joy when you have various or diverse testings. Different testings. God often does put us through testing times. The purpose of a test by God is to help you know how much you really know or how much you do not know about yourself. We really often do not know the truth about ourselves. The Bible tells us not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Sometimes we think that we are better than we really are, and then there are others who have that kind of a personality that they think that they are worse than they really are. I feel sorry for those kind of people, but uh, they're always denigrating themselves. But what is the truth about you? What is the truth about me? How can I know the truth about me? The Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things. It is desperately wicked. And God asked, who knows the heart? If my heart is deceitful, how can I really know my heart? How many times in the scriptures we are told, be not deceived, because so many people are deceived about themselves or their relationship with God. 
David in Psalm 139 said, you have searched me, you know me. You know when I'm down, you know when I'm up. You know my thoughts before I even think them. He said, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I cannot attain it. David is confessing, I really don't know myself. God, you know me. You know all about me. I can't attain such knowledge. It was Socrates who used to say to his students, know thyself. Self-knowledge is probably the most difficult knowledge to come by. And if you are able to come by it, it's probably the most painful knowledge you'll ever come by. To know yourself. In the light of the fact that, God, you know me, you know me better than I know myself, he closes that psalm asking God to search him. Search me, O oh God, know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is some wickedness in me. So a man who really knows that he doesn't know himself is the man who will say, God, you reveal to me the truth about me. And the way God does that is he puts us through testings. So the basic purpose of a test or a trial is that we might know the truth about ourselves. We may not be as strong as we think we are, and a test will reveal that to us. They are designed not only to show us our weaknesses, but they are also designed to show us our strengths. That is, our strength in the Lord. He oftentimes puts us through tests that we might discover how strong we can be as we commit ourselves and submit ourselves to him and how weak we are when we try to do things apart from him. There are a couple of passages of scripture in the New Testament that uh, I sort of uh, take for my scriptures. The one is in John 15 where Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. I tried to disprove that scripture for many years. <laughs> but I finally came to the acknowledgement, it's true. Apart from him, I can do nothing. But then I love that passage of Paul in Philippians, for I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So rather than saying, oh, I can't do it, I say, well, no, I can't do it, but through his strength, I shall do it. I can do it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I may think that I can conquer in my own strength, but then God puts me through the test and he shows me I have to rely upon him and he will sustain me in every situation. Abraham was known as the man of faith. And we read in Genesis 22 that God did tempt Abraham. Now that's tempt in the same as we have here in James uh, where he said, uh, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. So the word again is testing. God did test Abraham. Abraham's faith was being tested when God said to Abraham, take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom you love, and offer him as a burnt offering sacrifice unto me on the mountain that I will show you. 
And so Abraham packed up the gear, took some servants and Isaac, and they began to journey. Three days journey towards Mount Moriah. And as they came to the base of the mount, Abraham dismissed the servants, telling them that they should wait there, and he and Isaac would continue up to sacrifice to the Lord. On the way up the hillside of Mount Moriah, Isaac said, Dad, we have the fire and we have the wood, but we don't have a sacrifice. And God and Abraham answered, God will provide himself a sacrifice. And so as they came to the top of the mount and Abraham bound Isaac, raised the knife, the Lord said, okay, Abraham, far enough. Behold, a ram caught by its horns there in the thicket offered that. It was a test, a test of Abraham's faith and Abraham passed the test. What a wonderful thing it is when we pass the test. I love it, passing test. I hate to fail test because I discovered whenever you fail a test, you've got to take it over and it's good to get it over with once for all. And so the test was this, do you really believe my promise? Do you believe my word? God had said to Abraham, through Isaac shall your seed be called. Isaac was not married. He had not had any children yet. And yet he has the promise of God, through Isaac shall your seed be called. So, Abraham figures, God, you've got a problem. <laughs> I believe your word, that through Isaac the seed will be called. So he believed that God would raise Isaac from the dead if necessary. He had that kind of faith in the promise of God. And so it was a test of that faith. You really believe that through Isaac, the seed will be called. I, I promised you that. And now God is saying, offer him as a sacrifice. It is a real test, a, a very strong test of Abraham's faith, but God often puts us through test. I say I believe him. I believe his promise. And oftentimes God will allow me to have a test to prove whether or not I really do believe. I may make certain boast about my commitment to the Lord. I might say serving the Lord is more important to me than anything in the world. Or I love the Lord more than anything in the world. And the Lord will give me a test on that to see if what I am saying is really true. Uh, things will come along, alluring, attractive things. Will I reach for that and forsake my commitment to the Lord? You remember how Peter said to Jesus, when Jesus said, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times, Peter said, Lord, though I should die with you, I would never deny you. Now, you see, Jesus knew Peter better than he knew himself. That is better than Peter knew himself. Peter avowed, no, I will die with you. I will never deny you. And so Peter went through the test. What did he discover? He wasn't as committed or as strong as he thought he was. And when it came right down to it, when the pressure was on, he did deny the Lord. And so the testing was something that proved to Peter, showed to Peter uh, the truth about himself, revealing 
the truth about yourself. Now, we are told, count it all joy when you fall into diverse testings. The question is, what is my attitude when I'm going through a test? <laughs> Tell me honestly, do you count it all joy when you're going through a severe testing? You know, I have yet to hear a person say, I'm so happy because I'm going through a very heavy trial now. <laughs> and yet that's exactly what we're told we are to do, to count it all joy when we are going through these diverse testings. Peter wrote, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through the manifold trials, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, it's not gonna last, though it is tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, in whom though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. How can I count it all joy when I'm going through a difficult testing or trial? I can count it a joy because I know that I am in the school of the Lord and he's teaching me something that is important about myself, something that I need to know. And I can also know that through this testing, I'm going to learn patience, waiting on the Lord. Patience is one of those qualities that we all need. How many of you have ever asked God to help you to have more patience? I often pray that God will give me patience and usually it is, Lord, please give me more patience, and I need it right now. <laughs> Waiting on God. How many times through the scriptures are we exhorted to wait upon God? The Bible tells us that we have need of patience, that after we have done the will of God, we might obtain the promise. There is that time between my doing what God has called upon me to do, and oftentimes it is to pray, but then there is that waiting then for God to answer the prayer. And that is where the faith is tested. And, and sometimes we do all right for a while. But too many times I think that we set deadlines for the Lord. And we say, okay, God, this bill is due on Friday, and I give you till two o'clock Friday to take care of it, you know. And uh, patience is a difficult thing, but I need it. And these testings create patience. In Psalm 27, David said, wait on the Lord, be of good courage. He will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. In Psalm 37, David said, rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, or because of the evil man who brings wicked devices to pass. For the evildoers will be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. Wait on the Lord, keep his way, and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land 
When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. Isaiah wrote, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Lamentations 325. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeks him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. So James tells us, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, the trying of your faith is working patience. The testings that you're going through are teaching you patience. And then he said, but let patience have her perfect work. What will patience do for you? First of all, that you might be perfect. And the word perfect there is complete, mature. So patience creates spiritual maturity. It is in our young experiences with the Lord that we oftentimes are impetuous. But as we grow through the testings, the patience develops and we develop a spiritual maturing through patience. It makes us complete that you might be perfect or complete and entire, wanting or lacking nothing. So it, it matures you and it makes you just a complete person in Christ. Now, James in chapter 5 is going to come back to the subject of patience. In chapter 5, he's going to say, Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. For behold, the husbandman is waiting for the precious fruit of the earth and has long patience for it until he receives the early and the latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is drawing near. Take, my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for examples of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. And you have heard of the patience of Job. You have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord has great pity and tender mercy. And so he brings up Job as uh, a classic example of a man who had patience through testings. And of course, be thankful that God has never tested you like he tested Job. And uh, yet Job endured the testings and the patience that came out of it. But what was the end result? When the testing was over, we read, so the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 she donkeys, and also he had seven sons and three daughters. And after this, Job lived 140 years, and he saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. A great example of how when we pass the test, uh, then the blessings that God bestows as we have learned to just wait on him. So as we sang, we must wait, wait, wait on the Lord. And surely he will bring it to pass in his time. Father, we do thank you for these exhortations of James and for this book that is just filled with exhortations as we move from one area to another in our spiritual life, areas that need 
to be refined, areas in which we need to grow and to become strong. And so, Lord, help us when we are faced with testings, that we might have the right attitude, that we might rejoice that you are considerate enough to reveal to us things that need strengthening and that you reveal to us the strength that we can have as we trust in you and wait on you and rely upon you. So Lord, bring upon us, we pray, those testings by which you can show to us the truths that you know about us, that we might grow in grace and in the understanding of your love and your purposes for our lives in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen.